Can you see us? We are your family, friends, and neighbors. Living with ASCBD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. ASCBD is the underlying cause of 85% of heart attack and stroke-related deaths. This is a disease that threatens all nations and races. It's real, it's widespread, and despite the alarming numbers, ASCVD isn't widely known. And too often, it's overlooked. Every one of us is a statistic, accounted for, but largely unseen. Most of us are unaware of our risk, or indeed the consequences of ASCVD. We are an, an invisible, invisible nation. nation. It's time to change the course of ASCVD. To make the unseen seen. To work together to reduce heart attack, strokes, and lives lost. To help the world see that reducing the impact of ASCVD lifts every, every nation. nation. Help us to be seen. Share this video and visit InvisibleNation.com. And welcome to the latest and the final episode for 2022 of Cree's Spotlight series, where we aim to shine a light on different aspects of cardiovascular health and to raise awareness so that you can make informed decisions for yourself and for your loved ones. This evening, we are focusing on the role of cholesterol in heart disease, and I will hand over in just a moment to our host, but just a few quick housekeeping bits before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all registrants and posted on our website tomorrow afternoon. If you have any specific questions for our panel, please do pop them into the Q&A box. That is the box along the bottom of the screen with the letters Q&A, and we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. You can use the chat box. That's the one along the bottom of the screen that says chat. So there are two boxes, one with Q&A and one that says chat. There you can post comments, check something with our backroom team. The Cree Health team are working in the background this evening and we will be keeping an eye on both boxes. We also will post any relevant links to any resources that are mentioned here this evening in that chat box also. We have over 800 people registered um, for this webinar tonight, so we will not get to everyone, but I would like to remind you to please take note of, note of our nurse helpline number 091 544310, which we will post again at the end of the webinar. And feel free to give us a call for a chat at your leisure on any questions or concerns that you might have post the webinar. So you can do that tomorrow from 9 to 5.30. So without further ado, I am now going to hand over to my colleague, Neil Johnson, our CEO here at Cree and your, co your host for the evening. I also invite our panelists to turn on their cameras as well. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Annie, and um, welcome everybody. Uh, delighted to have such a large number of people registered for, for this evening's um, session. And really, it's going to be an informal session, going to take the form of a, of a conversation. Um, and hopefully, all of you listening will um, learn something that will be of benefit to you. So the opening video there referred to Invisible Nation. I just want to say that Invisible Nation is actually a program, which is a collaboration between the Global Heart Hub, Global Pro Pro Program, between the Global Heart Hub and Novartis and I want to thank Novartis for the support with this initiative. And as the name suggests, Invisible Nation, um, it's really to highlight the fact that there is literally an invisible nation of people living with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, estimated around 300 million people across um, the world living with this condition. And one of the primary contributors to ASCVD is cholesterol. So tonight we're going to focus on cholesterol and we're going to hear about the role it plays in heart disease and also we're going to hear from the sort of lived experience um, what difference it makes in terms of individuals health and lifestyle. So joining me this evening I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Susan Connolly. Um, Dr. Connolly graduated from uh, University College Dublin we won't hold that against her because she did decide to move to Galway after all. She undertook her specialist training in cardiology in the Mater in Dublin and after gaining her PhD, uh, she took up a, re a research post in the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College London. And in 2006, she became a consultant cardiologist with a special interest in preventive cardiology at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust and was clinical lead for the Imperial Cardiovascular Health Programme. And in 2017, 
she moved back to Northern Ireland, uh, where she took up a position with the Western Health and Social Care Trust. And we're delighted now that uh, in September this year, she's chosen to move to Galway in the West of Ireland, taking up a post as consultant cardiologist, integrated care at University Hospital Galway and CHO2 West, which uh, really is um, a, a great uh, development for cardiology services in the West of Ireland because it's bringing a consultant uh, cardiologist with specialist interest in prevention out into the community and that link between community and hospital. Susan, delighted to have you and thank you for being here. And I also have, I'm joined this evening by um, two lovely ladies, one from uh, the UK, coming live to us from uh, somewhere in, in uh, the middle of uh, the UK, and uh, that's uh, Emma Broom and Roseanne Butler coming from us somewhere in the middle of Ireland. And they're going to share their stories in a few moments. So Susan, if we kick off this conversation um, with that term ASCVD, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's something we're hearing a lot about um, lately, um, and uh, the, the term atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Can you tell us a little bit about it, um, and then more specifically, perhaps the role of cholesterol? Okay, uh, thanks, Neil, and um, I'm delighted to be here. So, yeah, it is a mouthful, isn't it? And I, it's not terribly helpful, I think, when you're speaking to patients uh, to say atherosclerosis atheroma blockages in your arteries we've lots of different terms but essentially what we're talking about if you can imagine uh, the arteries running through your body it is essentially a tree system you've got the trunk and then you've the branches um going outwards and over the years you can get build up of plaque in the arteries and i liken it to creme brulee when i'm speaking to patients um, so, you know, the dessert that has the hard top, but the gooey center and these creme brulees are laid down throughout the arterial tree. But the first response of the artery wall when this starts is the plaque grows outwards. The creme brulee pushes the artery wall out. So the blood flow is perfectly fine. Uh, the blood is flowing past these creme brulees and there's no problem. As it progresses, the creme brulee starts to encroach on the blood vessel, the center of it, but it's not blocking anything. Why do people build up these creme brulees? Well, it's multifactorial, um, but a high cholesterol is one of the most important risk factors, coupled with things like smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, family history, and so on. And then the critical event is when the top of the creme brulee cracks. And you know, when you hit creme brulee and inside it's goo and the blood flowing past meets the goo and it tries to clot the, the creme brulee to heal it. And the clot builds on top of this and blocks the artery. And that's when the critical event happens and a patient develops a heart attack if it's in the heart artery or a stroke if it's in the brain artery, or a cold leg if it's blocking an artery in the leg. But it's not just related to the heart. The idea is it's a systemic problem, um, and it's very common, as you know. So um, if I can just start at sort of a high level and looking at um, cardiovascular disease, and one of the statistics that was mentioned there in the video is that 85% of all heart attack and stroke are caused by atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, and then we hear on the other hand that 80% of, of this condition is preventable. So at a, at a societal level, uh, have we or are we too complacent about cardiovascular disease? Would you have a view on that? Well, I think we have become complacent in the 70s and 80s heart disease was an epidemic and uh, the rates of cardiovascular disease and the death from them was much higher um, and in the 70s and 80s we didn't have the treatments this, the prevalence of smoking was much higher and our diets were unhealthier in terms of eating saturated fat so our cholesterols were higher and heart disease rates and that of stroke have gone down over the last 20, 30 years, but actually they're now plateauing 
and in some areas they're starting to increase, particularly in the US. And that's because all the gains we made with reduction in smoking, better medications, those gains are now being offset by obesity, um, our obesogenic environment, poor diet, diet high in refined sugars, and so on. So yeah, we shouldn't be complacent. Um, and I think all of us know somebody who's been affected by atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And I think the worst manifestation is the disabling stroke or somebody who has a heart attack and the family, there's no warning and the family lose a loved one. Um, I think it's incredibly traumatic for them. So we shouldn't be complacent, no. Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, the number of heart attacks as such has, has, has uh, declined or decreased. And we know that um, people are making successful recovery from heart attack and they're living longer. Um, but the prevalence of the disease itself, uh, that's pretty much remain, remaining constant, isn't it? I mean, are we, you know, we're, not re we're not really getting on top of this. No, we're not. Now, cancer has overtaken cardiovascular disease as the number one killer, but atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is coming in a pretty, a pretty close second. And, you know, these dramatic reductions we saw in the 80s, 90s, 2000s in, in rates has stopped. And now we've got this and we've even got this. Yeah. Uh, so we cannot be complacent about this. Yeah. So coming back specifically to cholesterol, we, we recently uh, with Ipsos carried out a, a public uh, a survey of the public and in, in terms of their knowledge of cardiovascular disease and cholesterol. And staggeringly for me anyway, 83% of over 45 year olds in Ireland didn't associate high cholesterol with risks to heart health. Is that does that surprise you? Gosh, yeah, it does really yeah. very much so. Yeah. yeah. And we were we we're scratching our heads here to try and understand why is that? Um, certainly a, a number of years ago, cholesterol was very much to the fore. There was very much a strong set of messaging around know your numbers and so forth. But that 85 or 83% of people don't associate it with high cholesterol, with the uh, cardiovascular risk seems a bit strange, doesn't it? It does. And if you think of those creme brulees in arteries, the major component of them is cholesterol uh, and it's cholesterol that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, about lifestyle um, and uh, it is true to say, isn't it, that heretofore we've probably considered cholesterol in the context of an unhealthy diet, but there are other reasons why we uh, or people develop high cholesterol. Would you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the, the first thing to say is the average cholesterol in Ireland, total cholesterol is about five, and the average what we call bad cholesterol, LDL, is around three. But that's not the cholesterols we were born to have. And if you went to rural Africa and found a village that had never seen a McDonald's or Western civilization, their cholesterols would be half that. So these are Western averages. Uh, and, 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 and they're too high, which is why we have this risk uh, um, of cardiovascular disease. I'm sorry, Neil, I'm blanking on the second part of your question. Sorry. No, no, you, no you've, done, you've, done, you've done well in explaining to us there. I think what we're, we're getting, the, we're getting the, the message that um, cholesterol clearly is linked to heart disease and heart attack by the, by the accumulation. Um, and... Uh, I suppose one of the things I was asking you there was people. That high. It, it's to do with it, it, the, that it's not all to do with your diet. No, yeah. no. So sorry. Yes. So these cholesterols we're seeing in Ireland, these these average cholesterols are five. That's due to Western lifestyle. Um, but then you do see people with cholesterols, total cholesterols of seven, eight, nine, ten. That is not just Western lifestyle. That is usually what we call a genetic, genetically driven high cholesterol. Now, there's different patterns. It can just be the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. That's the main component there. And, and that can have a genetic reason where you're, the patient is simply not, the liver isn't clearing cholesterol uh, from the bloodstream. And it's a genetic defect. 
then you can have what we call polygenic high cholesterol. There's no one gene causing it, but there's mutations in lots of different genes. And that's a lot more common. And that's a problem. And then there's other reasons, for example, what we call secondary high cholesterol. So an underlying uh, condition in the patient, if you're taking a lot of steroid drugs that can put your cholesterol up, if your thyroid is underactive, that can put your cholesterol up and so on. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more because Emma and Roseanne have particular experience in um, genetically elevated high cholesterol. So we, we can talk to them about, about that in a moment. But just to this concept that I'm hearing a lot of people speak about recently, that heretofore we used to look at cholesterol in the context of a number at a, at a moment in time. And now the evidence seems to, to suggest that really the impact of cholesterol is around the cumulative effect um, over a lifetime. Would you explain, yeah. explain, explain that? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. The first thing with cholesterol is you've got biological variation. So you could check your cholesterol one day and it could be five. And the next day it could be 5.5 and the next day it could be 4.5. So there's a 10% variation. So your cholesterol fluctuates in your body. Uh, but the second thing is you're absolutely right. If you have a genetically high cholesterol, then as a baby, right through your life, you're exposed to that high cholesterol. And those patients present a lot younger with heart problems. Whereas if you have a high cholesterol due to a westernized lifestyle, that tends to occur later in life. And those patients tend to present then in their 50s, 60s, 70s, where patients with genetically high, true high levels tend to present in their 20s, 30s, 40s, because they've been exposed from the minute they were born to those high levels. Okay. So maybe I might turn to Emma in the first instance. Uh, Emma, if you would share with us your story of cholesterol and, um, and where you're at today in that journey. Yeah, of course. Um, so I tragically lost my mum um, back in 2013 uh, due to a heart attack. And we had no known heart disease in our family. Um, all of my family are, are petite. I, I weigh 48 kilograms and I'm five foot six, so not, not very big. Um, everyone's fit and healthy. My mum's cholesterol um, ratio was 5.4. Um, the doctor didn't think it was enough, you know, to, to require statins. And um, as I said, we found out when I was 11 that my dad had high cholesterol. But again, he was controlled his by diet. And that was in the 90s. And at that point, the focus was around, um, you know, saturated fats, etc. So from a young age, I had a very healthy diet and the rest of my family did. And we didn't think anything of it. And then, um, yeah, my mum suddenly passed away from a heart attack. And um, I got brought in to the family doctor. I got put on statins um, straight away. They did a blood test. My ratio came out um, at 8.4, which coincidentally was the same as when I was 23. Um, back then, I had a boyfriend who is Italian and his dad was a doctor. His dad tested me for cholesterol and the ratio is 8.4. He put me on a diet straight away while I was on holiday visiting them in Italy. And I went back to my family doctor in Britain and um, they said, oh no, you're so young, you're 23, don't worry about it. Your estrogen levels will protect you until you're in your 50s, and then you'll start to see um, a decline in your estrogen levels, so your cholesterol may go up, but you know, don't worry about it. So it took the passing of my mum for anything to be, um, to be done. And I was offered um, genetic testing at the time. Uh, I refused because um, I didn't have children. And I wasn't interested in finding out. I was scared. And also, it, you know, it, it puts up the price of things like health insurance and life insurance. So I was like, wasn't interested. 
Um, my job is a, um, oh, I'm a pers personal trainer, but I also work as a, um, a yacht chef and um, on, on super yachts. And uh, my doctor at the time was quite sneaky. This was in 2016. I just lost my dad as well, but my dad was um, considerably older. And although it was heart related, it wasn't as significant as my mum who had been 66. Anyway, so my doctor said, oh, wouldn't it be good when you're doing a circumnavigation if you don't have to go in and pick up statins in Panama, for example, or, or somewhere else remote? And, uh, and that kind of bribery, because I was like, well, yeah, that would be good because I haven't been tested, so I don't really know. So anyway, so I had um, the genetic testing done and it turned out I have familial hypercholesterolemia and also lipoprotein little a. Um, which in a nutshell, the way I always describe it, it's like you've got your LDL, your bad cholesterol, and then you've got your LP little a, and it comes and it like whacks your LP little a onto your arteries and acts kind of like Velcro. Um, does that sound right to you, um, Dr. Connolly? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, I've got, got the double whammy. However, um, yeah, I, I don't let it stop me doing anything. As I said, when I first found out, I was scared. I used to do a lot of running, a lot of cycling. Um, and I was, I was just literally too scared because I thought, am I going to drop down from a heart attack? I, I just didn't know. And with a lot of support from my, my family, my friends, uh, you know, I started running again. Uh, I compete in, I'm 43. I compete in adult gymnastics. Um, I was in the nationals back in August. I had a regional competition in October and last year I sailed across the Atlantic so I you know I have my medication I take um a torvastatin and I also I'm on um azetamib now as well because last year my LDL level started to sneak up a little bit um but at the moment it's fine I've um, I've been fortunate enough to have an echocardiogram recently and a um uh, CT calcium score and my score came out as zero and my echocardiogram is fine so I'm just making the most of everything at the moment and just keeping on top of my medication and going to see the uh, cardiologist yeah. when I get the letter to bring me in. Okay well, thank you for sharing that now if, before I go back to Susan that we'll go to you Roseanne but just to sort of summarize what, what, what we're hearing here is you you have had no cardiac symptoms or cardiac event. Uh, other than in your life, uh, the loss of your parents, your mother and father from uh, from heart. No, I, I, I've been very fortunate. I haven't. I mean, I've had chest pain and, and various things like that, but I always go and check them out. And fortunately, it's been been nothing. Yeah, but you have been diagnosed now with FH. Susan, yes. Sorry, you, want, you, you want to come yes. in? Sorry. No. Oh, your hand was up. Sorry. Okay, no problem. You were just waving at me. That's fine. Uh, can't resist. I'll wave back. Uh, Roseanne, uh, will, will you share your story? Because it's it's something similar, but yet different. Sure. Um, well, um, I was diagnosed with FH when um, my father died at age 35. And um, he was a New York City policeman and he died of a massive coronary episode um, when I was 10 years old. So. Uh, Six months later, my uncle, who was 39 years old, died of a, cardi a cardiac arrest. And within two years, all the men in my father's family um, had died. Um, my grandfather had died, I think, about an, a year beforehand um, and a cardiac event as well. So our whole family was tested. I have two older brothers. They were clear, but I was the one who had uh, extremely high cholesterol. So that was in the 70s in New York. And so I was just, my mother was told just, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, have a heart healthy diet and, you know, don't smoke and, and keep, keep um, physically active and uh, uh, make good lifestyle choices. So that's what we did. But then when I was 23, I was put on statins. Um, so never had a cardiac episode. Uh, the fact that I was diagnosed with FH at 11 years old totally influenced, I suppose, my choices in life because I became a physiotherapist, not because 
not because I um, was a competitive sports person in any way, but because I knew that if I kept physical activity in my life through my profession, it would stand to me later on in life. And uh, I also chose to come to Ireland. Um, I have family over here as well. And uh, it was a quieter life and a, a lot less of a fast paced situation. So then I have three daughters and two of them um, have FH as well. Now we found out just by a random um, um, hepatitis test for my nine month old because she stepped on a needle and uh, found out her cholesterol was seven at nine months old. And so the doctors just said, yeah, that's what she has. You have it, she has it but there's no medication till after she has, she goes through puberty. So I was grand with that. And for my younger daughter, she was tested. She has, uh, she had cardiac surgery, but she doesn't have um, FH because uh, she has Down syndrome and she was tested and she didn't have FH. But my oldest daughter, we didn't know until she was 20 years old because I did, I don't know why I didn't think about it, but I just didn't test her. She looked the picture of health and um so anyway she was diagnosed with it so the, my two daughters are on um statins and azetamibe and they're watching their numbers they're both healthcare professionals in their 20s and i'm on statins and azetamibe and um you know keeping trying to make you know the good choices and uh, so far staying ahead of it and being checked every six months by my cardiologist i suppose um, whether the statins and the zetamibe is enough for me, but um, you know there are other uh, newer medications coming on the market, but are not yet here available to people who are, like myself who don't have a cardiac diagnosis yet, other than just the genetics. So, I I I think it's really good to know that you, if you can be diagnosed with FH, you can own it and make smart choices and have an active life and have a full life and be very preventative uh, to come. Um, so that's sort of my story. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And you, you, you both through your stories raise, raise a lot of questions. In the chat there, I see somebody asking just to remind us again, what is, F, what is FH? So FH is familial hypercholesterolemia. And um, I'm going to ask Dr. Connolly to speak about this now. This is... Um, a genetic uh, predisposition to high cholesterol. Susan, um, what, what, what I'm uh, hearing or what I've heard is that um, uh, FH is uh, a common genetic condition, estimated one in 250, 300 people, um, has been described as a lethal condition. Um, will you tell us more about it and your views on how we should be looking for it, finding it and treating it? Thanks, Neil. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a very long term. Familial heterozygous hyperlipidemia is the technical term. It's what we call a monogenic disorder. There is a disorder in one particular gene, and it's genes that affect the cholesterol pathway. And in many ways, you have like mini Pacmans on your liver membrane that clear cholesterol particles from the bloodstream. And in patients who have FH, one of their genes is faulty for making these Pacman, and they're only they've only got fifty percent of the Pacman they need, so their levels are very high. If that makes sense, very rarely you'll get somebody who is an abnormality in both sets of genes, and they've no Pacman at all, and their levels are sky high, and they have heart attacks in their as children. But the one where you have 50% of your Pacmans, the FH, is common, one in 250 per population. But as Roseanne said, you look perfectly fine. Now, some people can have stigmata that identifies them. You can have waxy yellow deposits across the bridge of your nose and around your eyes. You can have lumps on your tendons, on your knuckles or on your elbow. Or you can have lumps on your Achilles tendon or their you can even get tendon rupture and that's due to deposition of cholesterol in your tendons. And then if you're under 45, you can have a white ring around your iris and that can be a sign of genetically high cholesterol. The clue 
is family history and an LDL cholesterol, a bad cholesterol greater than five. There are two big red flags, but not everybody has a family history and you can have a, you can have a genetic mutation that arises in you, but your parents didn't have it. Um, and that's why many countries, but not Ireland, have screening programs. So in Slovenia, every child at the age of five has their cholesterol done. In the UK, they have what we call cascade screening. So if a patient is identified like Emma, then all her family members are invited and screened for their cholesterol levels and are offered genetic testing. And in Ireland, that would actually be quite fruitful because you and I know when I worked in London, I'd see patients and I'd go, have you brothers and sister? And they go, no, or I've won. <laughs> Whereas in Ireland, you say, to, have you brothers and sisters? Yeah, I've got 10. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and you have a massive family to screen. Um, and it, it, it's, it's terrible. There's no program in Ireland to screen for F8. And there should be. And there's a lot of talk about bringing one. And it's something I'll be firmly focused on because as Roseanne said, once you identify it, you can treat it. I see a question that's come in the chat about statins. Um, I just want to say I've been in cardiology since 1995. I'm showing my age. That's when the first statin trial was published. But even when I was a cardiology registrar and patients came in with heart attacks, it was still a fatal condition, even if you've got treatment. But now, because of statins, having heart disease has become a manageable condition that you can control and you can have nearly the same lifespan as anybody else. Statins are miraculous drugs, and I have no shares in any of the companies. They're generic. But what I saw 25 years ago, I don't see now. So I would assure anybody on the webinar tonight to not fear statin therapy okay thank you for that so we'll come we'll actually go to some of the questions um because it'll probably lead to further discussion but to sort of summarize where, where we're at so far we we're, we're hearing that cholesterol is a major contributor to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease which is what leads to heart attack and stroke and we know that diet and lifestyle is a variable there um, but we also now know that there is a condition or a number of conditions that are um, genetically determined, um, and FH being probably the most common of those. Um, and as you rightly point out, we don't have a screening program. And that's perhaps for another discussion, because based on the estimations of 1 in 250, 300, that means there's about 20,000 people in this country walking around with a genetic predisposition, which can be fatal if not identified and treated. So um, to, to some of the questions, um, and, and some of these are, are, are probably more directed to you, uh, Susan. The question of statins, um, they've got a bad press. And as a consequence, they're, uh, I, I, I won't say there's an equal split, but there's certainly a minority of people who are strongly opposed to statins and taking statins. And they talk about side effects um, uh, in particular and, and, and fear of um, side effects that are that are very typically portrayed in the in the in the popular press. It, it, how how would you address th those concerns that people have? So, ninety five percent of the side effects experienced on statins are due to placebo. So, placebo is when you take a dummy drug, but it's a drug, so you feel better, and that's the mind, the power of the mind. The nocebo effect is when you take a drug that think it'll give you side effects and then it does. And the reason I can say this with such confidence is there's been two major studies that have shown this. And then in Imperial College, when I was there, we undertook a study called the Sampson study. And patients who were apparently statin intolerant were enrolled and they were given over a year boxes with statin therapy for a month, boxes with a dummy drug, and then a month off. And they were asked to rate their side effects every month. And they didn't know if they were taking the statin that month or the dummy drug. And we showed the rate of side effects was virtually identical in those taking the, the months they were taking the dummy drug 
as the months they were taking the statin. And we showed patients at the end of the study this data. And actually we got about half the patients who had thought they were intolerant back on the drug. Uh, it, it's not that they're imagining the symptoms. It's not as simple as that. The mind is incredibly powerful. And, you know, patients get headaches. There's nothing actually wrong with their brain, but the, the pain of a headache is very real. What I would strongly advise is doctors stop telling patients about the side effects they're going to get. And I don't do that anymore. Um, don't Google it. Don't read the Daily Mail. And my other tip is don't tell your friends you're on statins. And I tell my patients that because particularly in Ireland, everyone's a medical expert. Oh, you're on statins. Well, my cousin was on those and he got, you know, his liver gave in and oh, my cousin was on those and blah, blah, blah. I had a man who had a bypass and his sister was a midwife. And she said to him, don't be taking those drugs. They do X. And he stopped his statins and he came in with a heart attack. Now he was raging with his sister. So they're my cardinal rules. <laughs> Yeah, no, okay, that's good to hear. So a question about, is it possible to be cholesterol free? So I guess this comes back to the concept of, you know, cholesterol is a naturally occurring substance. Uh -huh. Yeah, so- Very, very good question. So as I said, the average LDL cholesterols are three in Ireland, um, but with these new cholesterol injection drugs that we can give in trials, we got LDL cholesterols down to 0 0.9. So uh, nothing we see normally naturally occurring. No signal for any safety or adverse effects. We also know that there's small pockets of families who have uh, genetic defects where they get very low cholesterol levels. And I'm talking about LDL cholesterols of 0.3 and 0.4, something I never see in clinical practice. And these, pe these people have been studied, they are fertile, they have no higher risk of stroke, they don't get cognitive impairment, and they don't get depression. So my answer is, from what the data we've seen, there is no level that is too low. Now you can't have zero, it just is not physiologically possible, no matter what drug you're on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you, um, allowing for the variables that we've discussed already, like diet or genetics, if you didn't have those variables from birth to, de to death, if you, left, if you lived a long life, is it the case that you would in any case develop in, in your final years uh, atherosclerosis? No. no, no, it's not interestingly. So we always assume people in their 80s or 90s have plaque, but actually that's not the case. And there's a study called BioImage that use CT to image arteries of people in that age group. And actually about 10% of them had no plaque. Uh, and if you look at community studies and lifetime risk, the, the first thing to know is that it's about six or 7% of us are truly optimal in terms of our lifestyle and our numbers. So it's a very low number, it's a very disappointing number. But over our lifetime, that 7% who are perfect have a very flat risk of cardiovascular disease. But unfortunately, most of us fall into the 93% category and will get plaque. But it's not inevitable. Okay, but is it age-related? So as we get old... It is age-related, but only because age is a surrogate marker of cumulative exposure to risk factors. Okay, okay. And that brings me to the next variable, which is gender. So we know there are um, significant differences between men and women. Um, what are the differences when it comes to cholesterol? One of the questions uh, here is, for example, does cholesterol increase in menopause? Um, that's and, and should women take HRT to prevent this, if that's the case? Yeah, it's a great question. So yes, your men, your after the menopause, your total cholesterol will rise in females, um, but also your HDL cholesterol, your good cholesterol rises as well. So your overall ratio isn't changing. Um, estrogen does protect women from cardiovascular disease. 
not completely, but if I see a woman who's premenopausal and has had a heart attack, I always look extra closely at why that's happened because it is unusual. Whereas we've many men in their 40s. But once women lose their estrogen, their risk will eventually catch up with that of a man's. However, taking HRT, it used to be thought, well, if you replace the estrogen, it'll reduce the risk, but it doesn't. HRT is great for dealing with side effects of the menopause and protecting you from osteoporosis, but it does not reduce your cardiovascular risk. Equally, if you have heart disease and HRT is associated with clots, you don't need to fear HRT because now you can take low dose in form of a patch. But, you know, it's a, it's a trickyish area and certainly something you should be having a discussion with your healthcare professional about. The other thing I would say to Emma, LP little a, lipoprotein little a, is thought to be constant throughout your life. But actually, there's new data to show that after the menopause, it does go up. And it's probably thought women, as they go through the menopause, they should have it checked again. So let's just divert to LP little a for a second, because that's the second time it's been mentioned. And for many people, they've probably never heard of LP little a. Mm. And it's something we're hearing a lot about now. Um, it is a known risk factor, correct? It's an independent established risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And in many ways, it's more common than FH. 20% of us will have a, a, an elevated level and it's under a strictly genetic control. So it's nothing you're doing. Um, you say many patients haven't heard of it. Actually, a lot of doctors haven't heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I moved to Northern Ireland, I had a lot of patients a bit like what Emma said, or sorry, Roseanne was talking about, they'd come to me and go, well, we're the heart attack family from such a touch an area. And swathes of them would have died from heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And they just accepted that was their fate. But I was like, well, no, hang on a minute. If there's lots of brothers and sisters and fathers, there's something going on there. And we checked their LP little a, and sure enough, it was up. And then we checked the brothers and the sisters. Now, we don't have drugs to lower it yet, although there's drugs in trial and we will have drugs in about two years, I'd say. But at least we could give these families answers as to why would they were the heart attack family from this area. Mm -hmm. And we could give them other things to help protect them. So would you be an advocate for testing for LP little a at this point in the absence of a treatment? Absolutely. And it's a recommendation in the guidelines that every adult in their lifetime should have it checked at least once. OK, but that, that's not being it's not being it's not part of the, the lipid uh, profile that's being uh, delivered now is it in Ireland. If you go to your GP and ask for a cholesterol profile. No, but it will be in Galway. OK, very good. OK, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, so um, in, in the context of LP little a, then just to, to summarize, you're saying it's a it's a an independent risk factor. So it there's a direct link between it and cardiovascular disease. We can measure it fairly easily. Mm -hmm. Blood uh, test. Yeah, and and but and and um, we don't know, of course, about lowering it. What impact it'll have if we haven't the, the, the uh, no the therapy yet. No, but there are two drugs in trial. Um, and both of them lower it by a significant amount. One is about 56% and the other coming is about 80%. So we'll know in about two years, but from the epidemiological studies, it is very likely that reducing it um, will, reduce, will reduce the risk of heart attacks. I, when I see a patient who has heart disease um, and they come back again with another manifestation, a second heart attack, or needing another stent, and they've done everything right. That to me is always a red flag that there's something genetic going on. And often you find their LP little a is up. Okay. And then that brings us back to FH. And the question here is, um, if you've been diagnosed with FH, can you or are you entitled to a CT uh, test or scan? Um, I suppose there's two parts to that what will the CT test or scan do for you? Um, but it also goes into, you know, what, what way are we looking after FH in Ireland at the moment in terms of treatments? 
Well, that's a great question. And the CT is a slightly thorny issue. If you're diagnosed with FH, and I would fully advocate the genetic testing, because if you're gene positive FH, you automatically are into the high risk category because you've had those high cholesterol levels since you were a baby. So you don't technically need a CT scan because you need to get that person's cholesterol as low as possible. Um, a CT scan can tell you if this plaque laid down already. It looks at calcium, which is a marker of plaque. And if there's none, if your calcium score is zero, like Emma's was, that's incredibly reassuring. It, and um, I don't want, to, I don't want to, be, to worry you. It doesn't mean you've no plaque because you can have non-calcified plaque. Um, I don't routinely do CTs in patients with FH because it doesn't change my management. Patients with FH should have their cholesterol lowered as much as physically possible with the available drugs. Okay. So can I go to Emma and Roseanne just to compare, for example, because you're both in two different healthcare systems, the journey um, in terms of your treatment uh, for FH. Maybe start with you, Roseanne. Um, so, well, I'm followed up in St. James and every six months I see my cardiologist um, with the routine uh, um, fasting blood um, lipids and, um, and liver function tests and thyroid function tests. And um, so now I'm on 80 milligrams of uh, rosuvastatin and 10 milligrams of azetamide and I'm on HRT plus I'm 59 years old and I'm postmenopausal over the last two years. And um, yeah, and that, that's, that's how we, uh, that's how I managed. I had also a zero uh, calcium score that my GP recommended me take. I had a carotid artery test every three years to test for um, plaque buildup as well. Um, and I suppose my cardiologist tells me that my low density lipids should be under two. Is that, a, 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 I don't know if that's right, Dr. Susan, but, but, but she wants to see them lower than they are. So she was also um, saying um, that when, when the injectable comes in uh, as a possibility for those of us who aren't cardiac patients yet who didn't have ne ever had an episode as a prevention she would be interested in putting me that on that because I am but but on the backs of having statins I remember when I first came over to Ireland in 1990 and I was already on statins and I remember the cardiologist telling me on the backs of these statins you're going to live a long and healthy life and as a physiotherapist I mean muscle pain are, uh, is multifactorial just because you're on statins, I have never had muscle pain due to my statins, thank goodness. And my statins have been working. And uh, yeah, so I think that the healthcare here, as long as you keep chasing up and owning your, your, your health and looking for uh, care, the care is there. Um, but it, it, again, the diagnosis needs to be made as soon as possible, because it is scary that your baby at six months or nine months can have a, a seven um, yeah, uh, cholesterol. And yeah, so so uh, yes, there, there's a lot of good care here. Yeah. Um, I, I talked to my first cousins who also have FH and they're in the United States and they're on a lot lower dose statins. There's a lot more argument about I'm not going to put myself through this and on this because of the stat, the, the bad rap statins get. Um, and then they blame if they had any other kind of medical condition. Well, it was because it was on my statins, which is not founded at all. And unfortunately, 10 years go by, 20 years go by, and they're, they're, they're playing around with their medication, which cannot be good in my point of view. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying that this is just my talking to my own uh, family. And just because those medications are available doesn't mean that people are going to use them. You yeah. know, I think there are injectables that my cousin has been offered. She was on it. And then some other health issue came up and she blamed the injectable. 
and I just don't see that as a logical thing um, or or I would question that maybe maybe yeah. it is that okay. case. so that's that's where I'm at okay and Emma from your point of view um from from diagnosis to current state the treatment is successful from your point of view and you're happy yeah with it? absolutely I'd just like to reiterate what um Razan said as well I mean I've been on statins now for nine years and um like Razan I've had absolutely no issues with them whatsoever no muscle pain no side effects at all um even when my dosage went up um, so I'm really happy that I have no side effects from the um, azetamib either. Uh, the treatment I've had um, has been very good and very supportive. Uh, cascade testing was offered to my family. However, my family, unfortunately, many of them um, are ones that don't just don't want to know whether it's due to fear or having mm -hmm. to change lifestyle. I'm not really sure. Um, and those were tested their GPs didn't regard their cholesterol being high enough in relation to their age, because it's my, you know, my aunts and things in their sort of like late 60s, early 70s now. So nobody's been genetically tested. Um, yes, sometimes it is an education um, for the GPs as well as myself, um, particularly when it comes to the LP little a. Uh, I had, I've had it tested twice actually. And, and you're right, Susan, it's really interesting. Um, I had it done for the second time a couple of years ago, so when I was about 40, and my cholesterol, my LP little A levels had actually gone up, even at that point, and I tried to have it done locally, and <laughs> I didn't get a result back, I was like, what's going on? And it turns out the, the lab didn't have facilities to run the bloods, and so we just didn't bother, and they didn't say anything, <laughs> so I had to go down to London to have it done. Um, the, regarding FH, we've got a trial going on at the moment uh, for uh, cascade testing uh, for babies, which is brilliant. So it's in a two-year trial at the moment. 30,000 30, babies are being tested with a heel print, pin prick at six months old, um, which has been funded by NICE. So um, that was uh, Patsy, who's... Um, listening as well we're both ambassadors for heart uk so we were involved in lobbying for that and uh, yeah it's it's very exciting and fingers crossed it might go away slovenia and uh, get introduced yeah so actually susan that we thank you for that emma um you, you mentioned your your interest in fh susan i'm hoping it's something that we can work together on because obviously there's a lot of unmet need in the irish context the questions are flowing in and time is running out um one question, Susan, your thoughts on this, given the, the chronic nature of cardiovascular disease, given the link for, uh, uh, in terms of cholesterol and particularly in FH, what's your view on, the, uh, on, on um, the idea of statins, for example, or statin therapy re re reimbursed? Because it's, 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 it's not reimbursed uh, presently. All right. And I, bear in mind now, I only am back in the HSE eight weeks. <laughs> yeah. And before this, I was in the UK for 18 years. When I lived in Northern Ireland, we didn't pay for our drugs at all. Now, we were paying for them in our national insurance, but yeah. my prescription was free. So I haven't got quite got my head around the, the payment scheme in Ireland. The thing I will say is statins are generic. So they're cheap as chips. Yeah. Um, and I see now the HSE is capping drugs at, is it 80 euro a month? Um, but I, I don't know what the prescription for a statin is, how much it costs in Ireland. It can't cost more than 20 euro a month when you can buy them for about five euro in Spain. Do you know? Yeah. So Roseanne obviously has some experience there. Use her hand up, Roseanne. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm on generic statins and I'm on 80 milligrams with the Zetamibe. And I think it costs me um, about, um, I think it costs me seven no let me yeah so it's about 40 euro a month but when i had it non-generic it was twice that and then of course you have your drugs payment scheme so anything that goes over that you you yeah yes but well, uh but having a yeah. condition like fh you're under the threshold it's not reimbursed you have to pay out of your own pocket right as long as yeah if it's below the drugs payment scheme 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it, it, it should be reimbursed. It, sh it should be free because it's highly cost effective. The exactly. health service be saving money in the longer term. Yeah, that's exactly where I was coming from. Um, this has been um, hugely informative. I, I hope those that have um, uh, joined us this evening have um, learned something new from this. Um, uh, let me just see, is there any final quick questions before my colleague Annie jumps in and cuts us off here? Um, uh, just nuts. Sorry, yeah, what was that one on nuts? I saw that it's, nuts it's, are good. Not so nuts good. are good, okay. just not salted ones. <laughs> salted ones, okay. Can you do? Can you undo the damage done by cholesterol? Um, it says, well, can you do the damage done by cholesterol by taking medication uh, or diet and exercise? So that's not the question. Isn't about reducing it. Is if there's damage done, can you um, can you reverse the damage? I guess. You mean to the arteries? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So patients always say to me, "Can we not just clean it out, like with the dyno rod?" And you can't. But the good news is whatever plaque is there, you can shrink. And I think that's a really powerful message. You can shrink it and you can stop it cracking and causing problems. And the way you shrink it, it was with, is with lifestyle and getting that cholesterol as low as you can. And that takes medication. Yeah. And if you prescribe statins, how quickly does it take for them to kick in and take effect and just show a real decrease in uh, cholesterol levels? Five days. Five days, okay. Um, as we see what else, I am, I'm sure Annie uh, is about to cut in and, and close us off. So um, my cholesterol level was seven good cholesterol, um, was 1.46, doctor said, put it all in a pot on a ratio of 10. My cholesterol is 8.1 because my blood pressure is like, I don't need statins. Not sure I can follow that, uh, that question. Um, let me just see as they're flicking down through the, because they're coming in at a, um, uh, an incredible rate here. Um, it, I would I would say, Neil, unless you have a genetically high cholesterol, it's not just about what your cholesterol number is; it's about what your risk is. And you can have a very have a very average cholesterol, but if you're a 65 year old man who's smoking, your risk is going to be high, and you will benefit from cholesterol lowering drugs. So the thing to ask your GP is not just what your number is but what your heart risk is. And there are tools, the GPs have tools on their database to calculate that risk. Super. Um, we have run right up against the clock. Um, Susan, thank you so much um, for a really informative uh, session this evening. Rosanne and Emma, thank you so much for giving up your evening, sharing your stories, um, and delighted to hear you're doing so well. And mm. it's a good news story. And I'm going to hand you back now to Annie, who's going to wrap up the evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Neil. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I think we're going to have to have another one of these uh, sessions because there are a lot of a lot of uh, questions still to answer, and people um, are are obviously very keen for for information. So. Um, Definitely, I think we'll we'll host another one of these uh, webinars uh, in the very near future. This is the last one for 2022, so uh, watch this space. Uh, we will be setting our schedule uh, in the coming weeks for 2023, and hopefully, we will be able to um, meet uh, meet your needs in that regard with your with information. Um, on the, the chat this evening, there were lots of things mentioned. So we do have a dedicated web page for the Invisible Nation campaign that Neil, that Maeve, or that, uh, Neil mentioned. So you can go there, www.cree.ie forward slash ASCVD, and you'll find lots and lots of information there. Um, as we mentioned also at the start, we do have our nurse-led helpline. We will have our nursing team uh, led by Maeve, a cardiovascular nurse specialist at the end of the line, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5.30. So anything that you heard on the chat this evening that you're still confused about or that you'd like to chat through a little bit more, please do give us a call um, and we will come back to you and, and we'll have a chat with you about that. The other thing is that if you if you call us and um, you, you need further information, there's the opportunity to join our HeartLink West chat every Thursday at 11 a.m. And our final chat will be on this Thursday at 11 with our Ashling, with our dietitian Ashling. So she'll be talking a little bit more about healthy eating for um, a healthy heart. So a little bit more there about the lifestyle, what we can do and what we can manage ourselves. And as Roseanne and and um, Emma have, have spoken about and 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 
portrayed so well this evening you know it's all in our own remit and it's in our it's in our own gift to try and really take control of our heart health and advocate for ourselves so that's what we aim to support you with and that's what we hope to help you to do um so with that um we will uh close out the evening before you share that video uh Bridget I just wanted to remind everybody sorry one last thing we do have a survey that will be going via email to you with the webinar link um, and we would be very grateful if you would complete that survey and return it to us um it's a survey monkey it's just a link just click on it and complete it that will help us to inform our webinars and the content for the coming uh 12 months so we'd be very grateful for your feedback and input on that and um thank you very much and good night everyone Can, Can you, you see us? us? We are your family, friends, and neighbors. Living with ASCBD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. ASCBD is the underlying cause of 85% of heart attack and stroke related deaths. This is a disease that threatens all nations and races. It's real, it's widespread, and despite the alarming numbers, ASCBD isn't widely known. And too often, it's overlooked. Every one of us is a statistic, accounted for, but largely unseen. Most of us are unaware of our risk, or indeed the consequences of ASCBD. We are an, an invisible, invisible nation. nation. It's time to change the course of ASCBD. To make the unseen seen. To work together to reduce heart attack, strokes, and lives lost. To help the world see that reducing the impact of ASCBD lifts every, every nation. nation. Help us to be seen. Share this video and visit InvisibleNation.com.